stigli smo do zadnjeg predavača danas. Evo, samo nekoliko riječi, u ostalom vama njegovo ime pretpostavljam i tekako poznato. Poznat je arhitekt, predsjedao je do nedavno svjetskom arhitektonskom organizacijom, bio je i predsjednik Američke nacionalne arhitektonske udruge, a kako politika i arhitektura, politics and architecture belong together, reći će nam čovjek iz dobro obavištenih izvora, sam čula da je uz to što je vrhovski stručnjak i bajker i glazbenik, ulazi uz glazbu Talking Group i Talking Heads, možda nam pojasni zašto, možemo pljeskom pozdraviti gospodina Toma Savonija. Yes, one of the members of Talking Heads was in my band. That's the way I like to think of it. Look, uh, thank you very much. Madam President, Mr. Secretary, wherever you are, members of the Chamber of Architects, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I also want to extend thanks to your uh, partners from the government, and of course I would like to mention the sponsors, but there are too many to name. Um, this is a city where I grew up. This is Milwaukee. Does anyone know where Wisconsin is? Anyone here know where Wisconsin is? Okay, a few. If you went down maybe 120 kilometers, it would be Chicago to give you a sense. That's the big city. Most of the rest of the state is farms and woodland. What drew me to architecture were the buildings I found in the countryside of the place I grew up. These are places that were built by the people who used them, using materials that were nearby, and knowledge that they brought with them from Europe for the most part. Sweden, Belgium, Serbia, Croatia. Uh, immigrants who came and had to build from themselves with what they could find. So I went to architecture school six years in university plus three years of apprenticeship. We called it apprenticeship at the time. So after nine years, I made a small firm uh, with friends of mine and we became quite successful in Washington. Along the way, I got interested in the work of a man named Oscar Newman. Uh, he did something called defensible space. He was thinking about the relationship between physical environments and the security of people who use those environments. I got involved in projects for the United States, including the embassy in Cairo, Egypt, and a number of other embassies for the US government. I worked on the NATO headquarters in Belgium uh, for four years before it was constructed. And over the years, I was active in my chamber of architects, my association of architects, and I became the president of the American Institute of Architects. This is our headquarters in Washington. It's currently being renovated. It was built in 1972. Quite a lovely building in its own way. That's the building behind. We also own the historic Octagon House, uh, which is very near the White House in Washington. I also was elected as president of the International Union of Architects, the UIA, which is headquartered in Paris. We're on the, 40, uh, the 47th floor of the Montparnasse Tower, which is the tallest building in Paris. Um, and you know the UIA or the International Union of Architects probably because it organized the competition that resulted in the Sydney Opera House, also the competition that produced the Pompidou Center, the National Library of Egypt uh, in Alexandria, and a number of others. I just wanted to tell you a little about me. Here's the topic of my talk. We all know what we mean when we say architecture. What do we mean when we say politics? What I mean when I say politics is the goals that are pursued by people in power and the practices they use to accomplish those goals. To me, that's what politics is about. What do architecture and politics have in common? We both make the same promise to the people we work for, right? We say we're gonna make your lives better. That's what architects say, that's what politicians say. History has many examples of power 
using architecture to create an image to enforce disciplines. That happened in Italy. That happened with Albert Speer in Germany. That happened when Franklin Roosevelt was president of the United States. I think it happened here in the former Yugoslavia in certain areas. Architects became, in a sense, the handmaidens of political power to build things that the politicians wanted. I want to talk about my adopted city. I think most people who see this sketch that I made from my window in the kitchen recognize that this is Paris. Um, and here is the politics and architecture that made the Paris we know today. Napoleon III in the Second Empire, the Baron Haussmann, the architect Alphon, the architect David, and of course, uh, Mansart, who built the buildings we recognize today as Haussmann's Paris, which survive and which are still a very good way to live. And what I just want to talk about is the fact that it wasn't simply a set of monumental designs. It was not fundamentally an exercise in making form. It was an exercise in studying the city and its fabric in great detail about circulation, about public space, about where people live. And if you look at the record of the discussions that Haussmann had, they asked questions like how far should a parent with two children be expected to walk to take those children to school? How many flights of stairs should a person be expected to climb with groceries and other things? So they did many, many studies of how, this is the 15-minute city designed 150 years ago. How close should people be to the essential services? And how can we make a city plan that is efficient and lodges as many people as possible but still gives them access to green space and to places where they will like to live? So yes, they built this vocabulary of facades, of roof forms, of elements, including ironwork, doors, windows, all the things that make what you see on the street. A very flexible and adaptable system. So Haussmann's Paris embodies to me what I think of when politics, and architecture combined for a successful outcome. Of course, Haussmann had his detractors. He did destroy many parts of the city that had grown up over centuries, and many people were displaced, but the result was really about making lives better for all people. And many of the vestiges, the things that survive today from what they designed, including this bench by W, still create what we think of as Paris and what we like about Paris. The vestiges from that 19th century set of interventions are still in use today, and some of the same principles are being adapted in areas that were not developed or that have gone into disuse after industrial abandonment. Paris is not the only place that's happened where architecture helps to create an identity. It happens in Vienna. You find a similar set of products and plans produced around the same time. And it happens in many other places. I'd like to talk about two challenges I think politicians and architects face in common. They won't be new to you. One is climate and the challenges of environmental burdens that are being put on the planet and its people. And the other is population, just numbers of people. I looked up the World Bank report about what Croatia faces. And here is the pie chart, we call this a pie chart in English, that identifies the most serious threats that are produced by environment to the people and the land of Croatia. Uh, it's interesting when you look at these, they're never really man-made. I would have added tourism as one of the one of the threats and, and hazards, and, I, and maybe some forms of capital investment I would have put up there too. Uh, but what do these all have in common? 
They all involve design and responses. And I, I, thank you for your presentation. I thought that was a very interesting set of discussions about the interaction between nature and the forces of nature and intervention. And in some of the other talks that I've heard have had similar themes. Um, so for us to be interacting with politicians in the politics, these challenges, the challenges of climate, are one area where I think we can help them and we can make a difference. The other has to do with population, and that isn't so much of a challenge in Croatia or, for that matter, on the European continent, but for most of the rest of the world, Africa, South America, great parts of Asia, population growth and the lack of housing is a huge problem. Uh, Mumbai, I, if our planet now has nearly 8 billion people on it, and the best estimates say that more than 1 billion of those people build for themselves using materials they scavenge, garbage, basically, that other people don't want, on land that they find, they expropriate, they don't own it. So there's maybe as much as an eighth of the world's population, one eighth of the world's population, that builds like this. And the result is that our cities become these places of enormous contrast. The contrast between sickness and health, education and ignorance, wealth and poverty, beauty and squalor. And so I think this is another area where architects can improve human lives and the planet. And I'd like to just, uh, if I may, take a few minutes to talk about the work of four architects three of whom I know very well and think of as friends of mine, because I think they offer us ways ahead and ways to think about how architecture and politics can miss, mix. Alejandro Aravena, in his housing for workers in Chile, understood that people build for themselves with whatever money they can find, whenever they can find it, and often using materials that are either inexpensive or salvaged from another building or given to them. So he built this basic framework, designed and built it, knowing that ultimately this was not going to be on the cover of a great design magazine, although it did wind up on the cover of a great design magazine when he won the Pritzker Prize. He accepted the idea that people would do this for themselves at their own pace, in their own style. And in so doing, he improved the lives measurably of the people who live in these places because they have proper plumbing, proper electrical connections, and all the things that you really cannot do for yourself. The second is Francis Guéret. Totally different context, very different part of the world. He grew up in Burkina Faso in a small village, got a scholarship to go to Germany. Many of you know this story. But once he was educated as an architect, he went back to his home, and he taught people how to build for themselves using materials they could find at hand. This is where I started, about the farm buildings in the area I grew up, using what they had at hand and building for themselves. There's a famous story about him teaching them about arch, arches and, and the power of catenary arches and how much they could hold, and they wouldn't believe him though they actually went up and stood on it for themselves. But he too is an architect who understood the context, the problem that he was facing, the resources that were available to address the problem, and then used his talents as a designer to improve human lives. Anna Herringer, a little closer to home, a, a German architect, the same idea, using materials that are indigenous, available at hand, but using the talents of a designer to apply those materials in a different way. Her work is widely recognized, and I, I expect many of you have seen it before. The fourth architect is not someone I know. Um, I've met him once, but I can't say I know him. And I mention him because this is an architect, Bjarke Engels, 
who for better and worse is able to capture the imagination of politicians. Uh, Rem Koolhaas has some of the same qualities. I've seen him, for example, in, in Lille in France when he won a, a design competition for the master plan of Lille. He used cartoons. He used a very basic way to appeal to people who didn't have much understanding of architecture. They didn't really understand our field very well. Ingalls is somewhat the same. Um, a great example is this project in lower Manhattan. Hurricane Sandy struck, it's now 11 or 12 years ago, a huge storm that brought water up into lower Manhattan, destroyed countless buildings, uh, did huge amounts of damage. And Ingalls, the, 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 the Army Corps of Engineers in the United States, had the idea that you struggled with. They wanted to build a high wall out of concrete all around lower Manhattan. And you know, enormous cost, ugly environmental impacts that nobody really wanted. Ingalls had a different idea. His idea was take that ring around lower Manhattan that is vulnerable to water and use it when it's not flooded as recreational space, as something people can actually walk in on bicycle on. And when it floods, have it act as a proper barrier. Design it so that it can accommodate a storm surge or rising water. So he's an architect whose work, I think, deserves study just because it is something that captures the imagination of people who don't really understand our field and who have power. I understand what Madame van der Leyen has in mind when she talks about the new European Bauhaus. And I know through the Architects Council of Europe and all over Europe, people in our profession have embraced this idea of a new European Bauhaus. My question is, why would you choose the name of what was essentially a cult in Germany before the Second World War to name an initiative that's supposed to accomplish so much. And especially because people who are not in our field, the general public, many politicians, don't know what the Bauhaus means. They don't know what it was. They don't really understand its purposes or why we admire it. So I think one of the challenges we as a profession face, and you, I think, in Croatia face with your political leadership, is how to speak to them in terms that are meaningful to them. Not, not to us, not to you and me, but to them and to the challenges that they face. So I think the message I'm gonna close here with this is that we do belong together, but I would change the formula to say I'm gonna improve your life, we are gonna improve your lives by saying to the politicians working together we can improve people's lives and, at the same time, the planet. If you don't like what I've said, um, or you would like to congratulate me for what I've said, here's how you can reach me. Again, may I please extend my thanks to you, uh, to Robert, wherever he is, and to the Chamber of Architects for inviting me. Thank you so much.